This is Hannah. This is Bailey. This is Butters. And I welcome to the No in the Class Vote. <laughs> Hello, this is Tony Blazer back with the second installment of my look back at O'Neill Racing. Uh, this one is going to cover the 1990s. Uh, in our first installment, we covered the history of O'Neill from its inception in the early 70s up through the 1980s, and this one's going to look at by far my favorite year for motocross, the 1990s. Um, I started racing in the late 80s, but most of my racing was done during the 90s. Uh, it really is my favorite year for motocross. Um, I did, uh, like I said, most of my riding in that time, and I love the gear, I love the bikes, I love the whole attitude around the sport. It was a little more laid back than it had been in the 80s, and certainly not as corporate as it is now. Uh, we're still all racing two strokes, which I'm a huge fan of. It really was a great era for motocross and a really great era for gear. Super colorful designs, uh, some bold new technology was added. Really a very, very interesting era for motocross in general and uh, gear in particular. Uh, if you'd like to check the uh, O'Neill article on this 80s, it is on our channel and it's also, I have a companion article on pulpamex.com where myself, Mathis, and uh, Doug Dubach actually commented on all the uh, ads and gear. I really loved it, what Doug added. He added some really interesting kind of uh, behind the scenes uh, information and opinions that were really interesting. And uh, if you like this sort of thing, definitely check out the article. Like I said, the Heaven Doug's perspective was awesome. I will be doing a article here on the 90s as well. Doug is going to uh, actually contribute to that as well. So it should be awesome. I just finished writing it today and uh, I sent the stuff out to Doug. So it might be a little bit. He's uh, As soon as he gets it back to me and I can upload it, I'll be, uh, it'll be up at publimex.com, hopefully in a few days, uh, maybe a week or two at the latest. Uh, if you'd like to support the channel, there is some awesome uh, Motocross Vault merch you can get at Teespring. The description is in the, uh, I'm sorry, the link is in the description below. Uh, you can also uh, help by sharing this video. Uh, giving it a little like and uh, tell your friends. I just certainly appreciate it. I do very, very much appreciate all the great support I get on the channel. 99.99% of all the comments are super positive. I love the interaction. I read everything everybody writes. Uh, you know, if I do make a mistake, everybody's quick to tell me, and I appreciate that as well. So I do the best I can to be accurate with this stuff, and I definitely really, really, really appreciate all the support everyone always gives me. So here is the story of O'Neill Racing in the 1990s. For 1990, the standard bullet pants were back, and they still included the questionably goofy-looking Ozone variety. As I said in the first installment, I actually never saw a set of these in person. I'm sure if you had a set now, they're probably worth something just because they're so bizarre. Uh, the only time I ever saw anybody wearing it was here in this photo for Motocross Action with Millie, Willie Musgrave modeling it for the 1990 KX125 test. Other than that, I never saw anybody actually use them. I don't know if they probably sold four or five sets. Uh, I think these are probably some kind of a reaction to the success Fox was having with their uh, print designs like the Zebra and the Spiderweb and all that other crap they were doing at the time. They were flying off the shelves. Uh, somehow I don't think this was quite as successful as that. On the jersey side of things, O'Neill still offered the bullet jerseys. Uh, these were basically the same jersey they'd offered since 1988. Um, they were... Probably in need of an update at this point, but they were still pretty good looking. I, I think, you know, if you weren't looking for the latest, greatest thing, they were still a, an excellent option. You could also get the Nude NU-D, which I guess is this called that because it doesn't have any graphics on it. It's just a solid color. I'm not sure. It seems like a real strange choice for a jersey name. Or the Racewear jersey, which to me looks like the Nude jersey, just with a, uh, a different design. I'm not sure what the difference was. Um, in any case, <laughs> it seems like a strange choice for a name for a jersey. Um, in addition to the uh, jerseys, there was an all-new uh, colorway for the Rock Block for 1990 that I think really uh, spruced up the looks. This kind of a bright flow pink went really great with uh, the pink O'Neill pants. And you could get a matching bullet boot as well, which kind of uh, freshened up the looks of that uh, moldy oldie boot that had been out for, I don't know, four or five years at this point. Midway through 1990, O'Neill introduced an all-new Bullet Geo line, which updated the looks of their pants, jerseys, and boots. Um, personally, I really like this. I love this crackle colorway that uh, the doctor's running here. The flow pink with the blue crackle on the back is very handsome. The pastel colors. The actual design of the jersey kind of reminds me of something you would have seen uh, as a logo for Miami Vice, kind of an Art Deco Miami Vice feel for sure. 
Uh, Jim Holly here looks pretty damn good in it. Uh, I think this was a good looking set of gear for sure. It wasn't maybe quite as bold as some of the stuff Fox was doing. Like I said, they were really going out there with their prints, but uh, this is to me is a much more successful attempt to kind of um, capitalize on that demand for color and, and very interesting, intricate designs, certainly much more so than the uh, ill-fated Ozones were. While it was pretty common at this point to see uh, Jim's son, Keith, in a lot of the ads for O'Neill, in 1990 he actually appeared himself in one here uh, for one of their catalogs. This is actually Jim on the 1990CR, one of my favorite bikes in the new Crackle gear. And it was definitely cool to see the company founder out there uh, twist and throttle in the new gear himself. For 1991, the Bullet Geo lineup was back with some minor graphical updates. You'll see the font here is a little different. Uh, the color palette is still that Miami Vice pastel deal for the most part, but I will say it's different, but not necessarily better. Uh, the Geo pants were back as well with some minor detail changes. Uh, if you look at the 9091 style, they basically differ ever so slightly. There's really not much in the way of change there. Uh, I do think they're still handsome, though. Good-looking pants. I really like, uh, again, the neon pink and blue. That neon green is also a really, really good color if you had a Kawasaki. Uh, the Geo uh, boots are way better looking, in my opinion, than the old bullet-style ones. Uh, I won't say they were drop-dead gorgeous, but they were good-looking boots overall, I think. Uh, there were some updated gloves for 1991. The new... Uh, O'Neill Geo Foam Gloves. They still look like a pair of oven mitts. They had some new molded in logos. I'm sure they're still hot. They still looked a little bit goofy to my in my opinion. Uh, never had a set like I said, but you know I do imagine they probably did a better job than protecting your knuckles than uh, a modern glove would. Uh, there was also a all new uh, foam backed uh, kidney belt. Although by this point I think kidney belts were already kind of on the outs. Now we also get a all new a chest protector for 1991. Um, this new chest protector looks a little bit like an AXO Pentagon to me. It's, um, I don't want to say it's a copy of a Pentagon because clearly it's a little different design, but certainly aesthetically it does uh, bear a pretty striking resemblance to AXO's design. The name of this new protector was the SDS, which stood for the Sectional Deflection System. And uh, it was configurable in four different uh, designs, which is funny. This kind of reminds me of the old Coming to America where the guy had McDowell's and he had like essentially a knockoff of the Big Mac. It was called, I think, the Big Mick or something. Because <laughs> uh, the whole reason that Pentagon was called the Pentagon was because it had five different uh, con configurations. So O'Neill left off one configuration and uh, kind of did a little bit of a Pentagon knockoff here. Not a ugly chest protector, but uh, continued the run of uh, meh looking chest protectors in my opinion. Now, uh, one thing that did get introduced in 1991 here was the all new World Force jersey. Now, this first World Force jersey is not my favorite. Certainly, I, I don't love this first design, but it would actually would become one of my favorite lines of O'Neill's gear here in the early uh, 90s. One last thing I want to mention here that got introduced in 1991 is the all new IFS pants. Now, uh, O'Neill at this time is basically falling in love with acronyms for the names of their gear. Uh, I don't remember what IFS stands for, maybe Integrated Flex System or some other gobbledygook. Uh, the main thing these things are remembered for is this wraparound logo. As you can see on Mike Craig here, it's a huge O'Neill logo. It takes up your whole leg, which is probably great for O'Neill in terms of uh, you know being able to see it and read it in photos and from the stands, but I never cared much for the looks of the gear in general. Um, I never liked that wraparound design. AXO tried it. Uh, JT tried a set. It really was Niff's never my cup of tea. Um, another weird thing is the uh, background they chose was like a diamond plate, uh, which was really weird as well. I'm not sure why that was... Uh, something they thought would look great. Maybe they were just uh, trying to compete with AXO and uh, Fox, who were coming out with those, you know, like I said, crazy print designs. So um, Ozone had not worked. Let's try Diamond Plate. It can't go wrong. In the early 90s, one of the interesting innovations to come along was gel printing. Uh, this was a uh, technique that AXO had introduced in 1991. And for 1992, O'Neill had their own version of it they called Prints here. Uh, the advantage of the gel printing process was it was a extremely vibrant colors and it was an all-over print design. The only downside was they uh, tended to not let the jersey breathe very well. So if you ever had any of the kind of gel print jerseys, they were like wearing a, a, a sweater. It was really, really hot, but they did look great. Uh, and these look really good uh, as well. 
Although um, with the IFS diamond plate pant, I am um, not a huge fan of that overall design. Uh, <laughs> I still don't understand what they were thinking with the whole diamond plate deal. Um, now here we have uh, Jim O'Neill's son Keith uh, rocking a little bit better version of the IFS pants. There was a couple of versions here for 1992. There's uh, two colorways that are uh, a little more understated, the black and blue and the uh, the yellow here is a much better look. It doesn't have the diamond plate design. So if I was going to go the IFS look, which I would not have, but if I had to, with a gun to my head, I definitely would probably pick this one Keith is running here. It's, uh, you know, as far as that goes, not too bad overall. For 1992, we also get an all-new World Force glove, which is a more traditional design. Uh, definitely like this, although it does have that wacky diamond plate built into it, although it's pretty subtle. You don't notice it so much unless you're right up on top of it. Uh, it came in some pretty bold colors like this aqua and pink, which was the uh, Miami Vice style stuff, uh, and several other colorways. Good-looking glove, in my opinion. Certainly much more traditional, more normal in terms of what you know, everybody else was running at the time, kind of like the original Paw Tector design or something like that. Uh, I imagine it probably ventilated much better than the old oven mitts for sure. As we move into 1993, the gel print jerseys are back. Uh, still good-looking, but really unchanged from the year before. They also have the uh, IFS pants. Not a big fan. Um, now, overall, I would say there are a couple of these that are pretty good-looking. Um, the... Second to left here, like I said, the one that Keith O'Neill was wearing earlier, I definitely would be down with. I will say it's kind of funny that they did not have a colorway that really was designed to go with that center one. The center one where the purple and uh, red and black. If you went with a purple, red, and black IFS pants, uh, maybe with the colored logos or something like that, it would have been pretty decent looking. But instead, you were stuck with the black and diamond plate, uh, which I definitely was not going to buy. Now, while the gel prints and IFS pants were largely unchanged, we do get a major update to the World Force line, which I really love. Uh, this is a great-looking set of gear. I like all of these, particularly the red and purple, and also the yellow and purple. I think that's really a sharp look that actually, if you came out with these things today, it would definitely sell. I mean, it'd update the materials a little bit. Good looking, classic 90s. I love all the bright colors. They look great. Got a little bit of an AXO influence there with the pinstriping. Uh, by this point, I think by 1993, AXO Sport had moved on to adding little AXO logos in there. But the earlier, like 125 STs, definitely had this pinstripe design. So, again, a bit of an homage to the competition. But overall, I'd say this is a really good looking set of gear uh, from top to bottom. If you were on a budget in 93, you could also opt for these new uh, Pro Light pants. Uh, as you can see, they have more of a, I don't know, would you say, like a Thermal Weld logo? Uh, it's not as high end as the uh, regular pants. They're not terrible looking, you know, so they're certainly better than like an Ocelot or something like that, <laughs> low budget pants. But uh, you could also opt for this cotton jersey. I don't know about you, but I actually miss cotton jerseys. I mean, they're not the best in terms of performance, probably. Uh, they don't breathe as well as a modern synthetic and stuff. But I like the feel of a nice cotton jersey. Um, and being a man of larger carriage, I like the fact that these jerseys aren't like painted on. I, I'm not a big fan of this compression stuff they got going on now. Uh, none of this stuff is terrible looking. And like I said, if you're on a budget, it probably made sense. Would have been, um, I usually had a set of something like this as a practice set of pants or and shirts to use through the week. And then if I when I went to the races, I'd pull out my expensive Axo Sports stuff or something that I spent way too much money on. So overall, good looking stuff if you're uh, not looking to spend a fortune in 1993. If you're on a budget in the gloves and belt department, there was also a Pro-Lite version of both. Neither one is very attractive, in my opinion. Uh, the belt looks like a gold belt from 1979. Pretty <laughs> amazing. It really is the same design, and those gloves are pretty hideous. Now, if you wanted to spend a little bit more, there was a revision to the um, World Force gloves for 1993. They added, uh, basically, it's the same design. If you look at the 92 and 93, there's really no difference other than uh, updated graphics. They got rid of the hideous diamond plate and went with a, um, I don't know if it's more classy, but certainly a more uh, colorful design. Uh, there's also a new boot for 1993, uh, the new uh, Geo 3 boot. I think this added top grain leather for the first time, which is a better quality of leather that you would have found in like a high-end Alpine Star boot or some of the nicer Axo Sports stuff at the time. You can see they added a good bit more texture to this boot. It certainly has a different look to it. It's a good looking boot overall. Um, again, I never had a set, so I can't speak to the quality or just how they felt, but uh, it looks like a pretty decent boot for the money at $229. 
Lastly, there is a Pro Light boot here for uh, somebody on a boot budget. This is clearly not top grain leather. Um, I had a similar kind of boot to this. Uh, my first pet set of like real motocross boots my dad got me for Christmas were Aerosport boots. If you remember those, used to be, I think they're a Chaparral brand. But anyway, um, the dang things did not have a little uh, plastic cover over where your toe goes for the shifter. So after about six months of use, I actually wore a hole in the damn things. Uh, it would let mud and dirt and everything in there. Definitely cheese ball, pretty much no uh, ankle support at all. I mean, it's probably better than riding your sneakers, clearly, but, um, you know, these lower, some of these lower bargain boots at the time weren't the best. Again, didn't have this set. Maybe they're better than my Aerosports, but they sure as heck look a lot like the Aerosport boots. Uh, so hopefully if you're riding with these, they're a little better quality than those. In 1994, O'Neill launched revisions for all their major lines of gear, and I loved it all. Um, I think this is probably my favorite year for O'Neill gear ever, maybe. Um, I really, really, really love this orange and purple combo that uh, Mike Craig is wearing here. He uh, wore something very similar to this to his lone Supercross victory at Tampa in 1994. I think it's just great looking stuff. I love the new print design. It has kind of a flame motif to it. I think that looks great. Uh, the new World Force pants. The, the gigantic logo is maybe a little much, but I think overall it's a good look. And I think the colors really make a... Uh, make it stand out. I, I really like that orange. Man, I've always had a soft spot for orange. I love the Bradshaw on the orange. Uh, definitely one of my favorite color combos for sure. As much as I love the prints, I think the World Force jerseys are even better looking. Um, I love the fade. They're really sharp. The color combos are all real nice. Uh, again, that orange and the red and the purple is beautiful. The blue looks really sharp. Um, I kind of like this new logo design they have this year. Just really good looking stuff in general. I think O'Neill really hit it out of the park here in uh, 1994. I think all the stuff's great. Even the new uh, lower cost pants. Actually, the ones, it's funny, Mike Craig seemed to wear these more than the World Force ones. Maybe the logos were not quite as heavy. I'm not sure, but um, they, they were really great looking pants as well. I mean, honestly, I think I do prefer the Pro 2 pants to the uh, standard uh, World Force ones. They're actually a little cleaner design, particularly in that orange and uh, pink or red or whatever you want to call that color. I love that combination. The the old kind of little more understated logo is actually nice. I didn't like the jerseys here as much as cotton ones. They're uh, not as attractive in my opinion, but uh, both the pants are good looking. This World Force pants here is pretty handsome. And like I said, it was a pretty big deal for O'Neill to have Mike Craig in the uh, their gear in, in 1994. He did deliver that Supercross win, but Unfortunately, uh, halfway through the year, he would end up getting dumped by Yamaha. Uh, his results would kind of steadily deteriorate, and he had a famous incident where he claimed he had uh, tripped over a boot. Um, I think it's probably more accurate. He's probably drunk or who knows what. But in any case, uh, he got let go by Yamaha midway through the year and ended up going to Yamaha of Troy. I'm sorry, Honda of Troy at the time, which I think was maybe Cinesalo in 1994. But uh, don't quote me on that. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, anyways, it was nice while it lasted. Uh, the Greg, Craig looked good in this stuff during Supercross, but uh, for the outdoors, he was no longer on Yamaha, and they uh, bumped John Dowd up. So um, it was the end of the O'Neill and uh, Mike Craig uh, marriage, which only lasted about half a year. With Mike Craig gone, Suzuki's Craig Decker became O'Neill's highest profile rider in 1995. He was moving over from, ironically, the Honda of Troy team, where Craig went uh, when he lost his Yamaha ride. Uh, Craig Decker actually rode pretty well this year, if I remember right. He looked really good in the good. This is gear, uh, pretty good looking stuff, I think, for 1995. Uh, it really doesn't change a whole lot from the previous year. Uh, the main difference is a couple of new colorways. Uh, there's a really cool black and gold colorway that Craig Decker always wore. I, I really love that color combo. Uh, it's a really good look, in my opinion. Unfortunately, my beloved uh, Orange is gone. Uh, rest in peace, Orange. He only lasted one year, but uh, it was a great year. Uh, so for 1995, you get a redesign of the Prince jerseys. I didn't really care for this redesign. I don't like it as well as the previous one with the flames and stuff. I think it was nicer. The World Force jerseys are slightly different, and the pants are slightly different. It's a subtle change. Uh, basically, it's the same overall feel and look. Uh, not a whole lot different in, uh, from 1994 for the most part. As I said, this black and gold combo is probably my favorite in the new colorways. It looks really great in the Wolf Force. Maybe not as great with the uh, prints. Uh, the blue, still handsome, very good look overall. Um, 
maybe the my second choice is probably the the red after the gold. But all this stuff is good. Uh, none of it's bad looking stuff in '95. I would say uh, this '94 '95 era is certainly one of my favorites for O'Neill. Good looking stuff overall. And in addition, of course, I don't want to forget they still had the Doctor, Doug Dubok, and O'Neill. He was a stalwart and still repping the brand. Um, actually, still repping the brand to this day. But uh, he was uh, kind of a support rider doing a few things uh, like vet nationals and what have you in 1995. But you'd still find him out there uh, repping the O'Neill brand. For 1996, we get a really significant redesign of the O'Neill lineup uh, with an all-new introduction of hardware gear. Uh, this new hardware line has a kind of a much more of an earth tone to it. I like that. The the kind of gold tones in there and all the jerseys and stuff are pretty handsome. You also notice the logo is really prominent on these. It's kind of a theme here in the late 90s. They really made that logo big. You couldn't uh, miss. O'Neill, I guess, always wanted to make sure you knew what you were wearing there. So you have an all-new O'Neill uh, hardware pant. Um, pretty good looking stuff overall. Uh, you have a couple of new colorways here for the SDS uh, chest protector. Still not great looking. I guess it looks okay in that gold there. Uh, they still have the IFS boots. They love their acronyms at O'Neill. We also get an all new impact boot and impact pants and jerseys. I got to be honest, I don't remember the impact line at all. I never saw anybody wearing it that I remember. Um, the hardware stuff, though, I know was popular. I, I know people around around us had. I never had a set of it, but I thought it was good looking stuff this year, in general. Pretty pretty handsome stuff. Uh, you still had the, of course, the lower end uh, gear, uh, boots and gloves and what have you too. If you're on a budget, not terrible looking stuff. Uh, overall, would have been all right if you're like looking for practice gear, like I said, or you're on a budget. Now for '96, uh, Craig Decker was still under the O'Neill. Uh, lineup, but he actually suffered a broken back. His factory Suzuki shock, if I remember right, broke and uh, caused him to crash while testing before the season, and he ended up missing that year. So they ended up uh, bringing Jamie Dobb um, to up to the factory team, and he ended up riding factory Suzuki and Supercross, and he was O'Neill's biggest rider that year. And you can see him here, he's wearing that uh, pretty handsome green and gold combination. Uh, he actually won, I think, the Troy... No, it was Red Bud. I think he won the first motor Red Bud, actually, after he had lost his factory Suzuki ride. He ended up going to uh, ride a privateer Quicksilver bike. He ended up winning a moto, but then he was so exhausted he couldn't finish the second moto. Uh, but he did get O'Neill in the victory roster, at least for one moto. Uh, he also had... Like I say, Craig, I don't remember if Craig came back at all in, late in the year. Uh, you have, there's a picture of him uh, riding for his uh, the Suzuki maybe early on in the year before it uh, I threw him off. I don't remember. But in any case, uh, this was some good-looking gear and kind of uh, changed the overall look and design of uh, O'Neill for the rest of the decade. For 1997, Jamie Dobb was uh, off to Europe. So O'Neill's top guns were uh, Moto Triple X riders Brian Deegan and Brian Swink. Uh, both these guys obviously are popular riders for many different reasons. Uh, Swink's no longer with us, which is a sad, sad story of its own. Uh, Deegan actually is um, now a pretty famous mini dad. His kid's pretty fast. So here we have uh, Swink in the O'Neill gear for 1997. I really like this gear. It was good-looking stuff in general. Um, I think the overall mo more monochromatic design for 97 is an improvement. I think it's a really handsome overall look, although I'm not sure who this chick in the pink hair is. Um, she does have a kind of a cool early 80s O'Neill jersey. Uh, here's the uh, Brian Deegan's actual jersey he wore in 1997. Like I said, it's monochromatic. Uh, the, the earth tones are gone, but overall it's a real nice look, I think. The logos are huge. As I'd said earlier, O'Neill went giant with these logos, so you weren't going to be mistaken as to who the heck uh, made this jersey. Um, here's our pink haired lady again. Um, the jerseys, like I said, I like the new purple colorway. The red looks great. Really a good overall look. The pants, the hardware pants for 97 are very monochromatic as well. Just a clean, clean design and one of my favorites of the 90s. Certainly, uh, I don't think you'd have much fault unless you're not a fan of giant logos, in which case you're out of luck. Uh, with Deegan being like the number one rider this year, I, I bet he actually sold O'Neill more gear in spite of not being a factory rider this year. Uh, Deegan was real popular even then as a privateer kind of for his uh, no F's given attitude. And he famously won the uh, 1997 Los Angeles Supercross and then proceeded to uh, throw his bike over the finish line here. This is a little photo, I think, from Motocross Action of him uh, chucking his jersey, I mean, chucking his uh, bike over the line. And then here's a black and white, pretty much a infamous moment in motocross history and uh, certainly an iconic one for both uh, Deegan and his uh, teammate there, uh, Kenny Watson on the team. Um, one of those mem memories to remember, or well, moments to remember for sure. In 1998, 
Mike LaRocco had a very public falling out with Factory Suzuki. They'd had a rough couple of years. In fact, he had tried to quit the team midway through the 97 season, which didn't work out. So for 1998, he switched to an all-new team backed by Factory Connection, the all-new Jack-in-the-Box Honda team. And when he made that switch, he actually switched gear uh, companies as well. He went away from his longtime uh, gear company, MSR, and went with O'Neill for the first time. Um, this uh, pairing was, a, I would say, a pretty good one for O'Neill. Certainly, LaRocco was a very popular rider, even though he'd had a couple of bad seasons there. Uh, they also ended up hiring uh, Jimmy Button, who was uh, on the Chaparral Yamaha team. Chaparral really stepped it up in 1998. They hired Jeremy McGrath, who had uh, spent the previous year on the uh, Suzuki team uh, with the uh, Suzuki of Troy, actually, not the factory Suzuki team, although he's on a factory bike. So uh, Chaparral had quite a high profile in 1998. So having Jimmy Button on the team, even though uh, McGrath was not running uh, O'Neill, I'm sure it helped O'Neill's profile having him uh, teamed up with McGrath as to the gear for 1998, it wasn't much different than 97. As you can see, it's very similar design. They changed a few things, added a little more color. You can see like there's a splash of color here in the red that had a little purple accent. The, the other red has a little bit of a yellow accent to it. I like that a lot. It's definitely good looking stuff in general. Um, I like it maybe a little bit better just because I kind of like the splash of color they added, but it's very, very similar to what they'd had in 97, but I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, the only thing I don't, I'm not a big fan of these cheesy uh, O'Neill helmets. Um, there's also an all new matrix chest protector for 1998, which is again, not hideous, not great. Um, I'm sure it was protective and they actually added the suspended shoulder pads that Fox and HRP had had since the eighties. They finally got around to adding that for 1998. Now, one last thing I do want to mention here is, uh, this is the first year that I remember them actually having these, uh, very attractive young ladies in bikinis in their ads. And I always, uh, they continue this today. Swap Moto Live, you go to their website, they still have, uh, the Moto Models doing wallpaper, and it's sponsored by O'Neill. So it's probably Jim Holly's idea. He was always a big fan of the ladies, and uh, I, I highly endorse these ads. I always liked them a lot. Uh, it only thing it assured was you weren't going to see these ads in motocross action. I think Roland Hines is pretty religious, and he was not a fan of uh, having these uh, rather attractive ladies in the ads. In the magazine, they so they would never see there. But you'd see it in Racer X or MX Racer or later Trans World. Um, definitely one of the uh, high points here of the late 90s O'Neill uh, ads. All right, for 1999, we get a pretty subtle update to the hardware uh, jersey. It has a little different look to it. The logo is still tremendous. Um, there's more of a straight up and down linear look to the graphics. I do like the yellow and blue combo here on the far left. I think that was a good look. As you can see, they brought that, uh, kind of a subtle wraparound look to the logos. Uh, never liked the wraparound look, still don't like it. Um, overall, I say I don't really care for this 99 look as much as 98 or 97. I think they were superior. Interesting to note, too, that Jimmy Button's here in this ad. Now, this ad for the 99 gear appeared in 1998, of course. The stuff comes out mid-years like cars do. Uh, but for actual uh, 99 on the track, Jimmy Button was moved up to the factory Yamaha team, and he was running uh, Fox gear. I believe Yamaha still was under a Fox uh, clothing deal. So the biggest name in 1999 in O'Neill was Mike LaRocco. LaRocco is back. Uh, still in the Jack in the Box uh, Factory Connection team, uh, running O'Neill's gear. You still had uh, Doug Dubach as well, running O'Neill, uh, looking very good here in the uh, blue and yellow combo, which was pretty decent. Uh, there were a couple. There was another uh, design as well available for 1998, the new Method gear. Um, I don't really remember this design. It kind of reminds me of some Thor stuff from the early 2000s. Uh, I do prefer the hardware look to this. I, I'm not sure if this was the lower priced option. I really don't remember much about it. Uh, and if you were into baggy clothes, which I uh, was not, even though I'm a big guy, so baggy probably would be better for me. Uh, I never liked the baggy gear look, but uh, O'Neill did jump on that bandwagon here in the late 90s. They had the Apocalypse gear. Uh, this young lady seems to be extremely... Um, enjoying the gear liking it quite a bit for some reason uh but i never wore it never liked it wouldn't have been caught dead in it so um unless you're a hot blonde in a bikini you probably wouldn't want to want to be wearing this now um i guess we've reached the end of the 90s for o'neill um I, if you like this sort of thing make sure you check out part one where i went over the uh 70s late 70s early 80s o'neill gear uh the origins of the company i've also done several other gear uh companies here on the channel 
I'm also writing a accompanying article on Pulp MX. You want to check that out as well, uh, where myself, Doug Dubach, and Steve Mathis uh, comment on this gear and uh, kind of ruminate on what we liked and didn't like. Uh, if you want to see another brand, uh, let me know in the comments section below, or you can always hit me up on Twitter, and that handle is at Tony Blazer, and that's T O N Y B L A Z I E R. And I certainly hope you enjoyed this. If you'd like to support my channel, help me out. Um, I do have motocross vault merch available. It's in the little shelf here on YouTube. I would certainly love the uh, help and appreciation, appreciate any support you can give me sharing this on social media. Or if you decide to buy some merch, that'd be awesome as well. So thank you for watching. Until we meet again, keep the rubber side down. Peace.